from around the globe. It's theCUBE, presenting Accelerating Automation with DevNet, brought to you by Cisco. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE, coming to you from our Palo Alto studios with ongoing coverage of Cisco DevNet Create. We've been going to DevNet Create, I think since the very beginning. This year, of course, like everything else, it's, it's virtual. So we're excited to cover it virtually and digitally like we have a lot of other shows here in 2020. And we're excited to have our next guest. We've got uh, Kuhn Jacobs. He's the director of systems engineering uh, for Cisco. Good to see you, Kuhn. Thank you for having me. And Good joining him is Eric Nip. He is the VP of System, Systems Engineering for Cisco. Good to see you, Eric. Good to be here, thank you. Pleasure. So uh, before we jump into kind of what's going on now in this new great world of programmability and, and control, I want to kind of go back to the future for a minute because when I was doing some research for this interview, it was Kuhn, I saw an old presentation that you were giving from 2006 about the changing wow. evolution of the, uh, the changing evolution of networking and moving from, I think the theme was a human-centered human network and you were just starting to touch a little bit on video and online video. Yeah. Oh my goodness, how far we have come. But I, but I would love to get kind of a historical perspective because we've been talking a lot and I know Eric's uh, son plays football about the football analogy of the network is kind of like an offensive lineman where if they're doing a good job, you don't hear much about them, but they're really important to everything. And the only time you hear about them is when the flag gets thrown. So if you look back with the historical perspective, the load and the numbers and the evolution of the network as we've moved to this modern time. And you know, thank goodness, because if COVID hit five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, all of us in the information space would not have been able to make this transition. So I just, I just love to get some historical perspective because you've been kind of charting this and mapping this for a very long time. Yeah, we absolutely have. I think, you know, what you're referring to was back in the day, the human network campaign. And to your point, the, the load, the, the number of hosts, uh, the traffic, the just overall the intelligence of the network has just evolved tremendously over these last you know, decade and a half, uh, 15 years or so. And you look at where we are now in terms of the, the programmable nature of the network and what that enables in terms of new degrees of relevance that we can create for the customers um, and how, you know, the role of IT has changed entirely again especially during this pandemic you know the fact that it's now as a service and elastic uh, is is absolutely uh, fundamental to being able to ensure uh, on an ongoing basis a great customer experience and so uh, it's been it's been uh, a very interesting ride indeed yeah and then and then just to close the loop the one of your more later interviews talking to Sylvia your the whole question is are you a developer or an engineer so it's, and and your whole advice to all these network engineers is just just dump, jump in and start doing some coding and learning so you know the focus and really the emphasis and and where the opportunity to differentiate is a com is completely mm. shifting gears over to the you know really software defined side Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, you, you look at how the software world and the network has come together and how we're applying now, you know, basically the same construct of CI, CD pipeline to network uh, infrastructure, look at network really as code and get all of the benefits from that and the familiarity of it. Uh, the way that our engineers have had to evolve in that is just, you know, quite, quite significant in, in, in like the skill set. And, and the best thing is jump in. Right. Um, you know, dip your toe in the water, but continue to evolve that skill set. And uh, you know, don't don't be shy. It's it's a leap of faith for some of us who've been in the industry a bit longer. Uh, you know, we like to look at ourselves as the craftsmen of the network, but now it's definitely uh, software centricity and uh, and programmability. Right. So Eric, you've got some digital exhaust out there too that I was able to dig up. Going back to two thousand and two. <laughs> 752 page book in the very back corner of a dark, dirty, dusty Amazon warehouse is managing Cisco network security. 752 mm. pages. Wow. How has security <laughs> changed from a time where before I could just read a book, a big book, you know, throw some protocols in and probably block a bunch of ports to the world that we live in today where everything is connected, everything is API driven, everything is software defined. You've got pieces of workload spread out all over the place. And oh, by the way, you need to bake security in at every single level of the application stack. Yeah, no, um, so wow, kudos that you uh, you found that book. I'm, I'm really impressed there, so thank you. A uh, little street cred. So uh, I want to hit on something that you you talked about because I think it's very important to, to this overall conversation. 
if we think about the scale of the network, and Kuhn hit on it briefly, you talked about it as well, we're seeing a massive explosion of devices. By the, uh, you know, it's estimated by the end of this year, there's gonna be about 27 billion devices on the global internet. That's about 3.7 devices for every man, woman, and child alive. And if we extrapolate that out uh, over the course of the next decade on the growth trajectory we're on, and if you look at some of the published uh, research on this, it's estimated there could be upwards of 500 billion devices accessing the global internet on a, uh, on a daily basis. And primarily that, that, that is uh, IoT devices, that's digitally connected devices. Anything that can be connected will be connected. And that introduces a really interesting security challenge because every one of those devices that is accessing that global internet is within a company's infrastructure or accessing pieces of corporate data is a potential attack vector. So we really need to, and I, I think the right expression for this is we need to reimagine security because security is, as you said, not about perimeters. You know, I wrote that book back in 2002. I was talking about firewalls and, and a uh, cutting edge technology was intrusion prevention and intrusion detection. Now we need to look at security really in the in the guise of or under the under the under the realm of really two aspects, the identity, who is accessing the data and the context, what data is being accessed. And that is going to require a level of intelligence, a level of automation and technologies like machine learning and automated intelligence are going to be our artificial intelligence rather are going to be uh, table stakes because the sheer scale of what we're trying to secure is going to be untenable under current, you know, just current security practices. I mean, the network is going to have to be incredibly intelligent and leverage, again, a lot of that, uh, that AI type of data to match patterns of potential attacks and ideally shut them down before they ever cause any type of damage. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, one thing that COVID has done amongst many things is kind of re-taught us all about the power of exponential curves and, and, and mm -hmm. how extremely large those things are and how fast they grow. We had Dave uh, Renzen on at uh, Google Cloud a couple years ago, and I remember him talking about early days at Google when they were starting to map out, kind of as you described, kind of map out their growth curves, and they just figured out they could not hire. If they hired everybody, they couldn't hire enough people to deal with it, right? So really kind of rethinking automation and rethinking about the way that you manage these things and, and the level, right? The old, is it a pet or is it, or is it, um, uh, part of a herd. And, and I think it's interesting what you talked about, uh, Kuhn, really the human powered internet and being driven by a lot of this video, but to what you just said, Eric, the next big wave, right, is IoT and 5G. And I think, you know, you talk about 3.7 de uh, devices per person, that's nothing compared to, right, all these sensors and all these devices and all these factories, because 5G is really targeted to machine to machines, which there's a lot of them and they trade a lot of information really, really quickly. So, you know, I want to go back to you, Kuhn, thinking about this next great wave in a 5G IoT kind of driven world where it's kind of like when voice kind of fell off compared to IP traffic on the network. I think you're going to see the same thing, kind of human generated data relative to machine generated data is also going to fall off dramatically as the machine generated data just skyrockets through the roof. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think to, to also what Eric touched on, the visibility on that, and they'd be able to process that data at the edge, that's going to catalyze cloud adoption even further. And it's going to you know, make the role of the network, the connectivity of it all, and the security uh, within that crucially important. And then you look at the role of programmability within that, we're seeing the evolution going so fast. You look at the, the element of the, the software defined network uh, in an IoT spe space, we see that we have uh, hosts there that are not necessarily um, you know, behaving like other hosts would uh, on a network. For example, a manufacturing floor a production robot or a security camera. And what we're seeing is we're seeing you know, partners and customers employing programmability to make sure that we overcome some of the shortcomings uh, in terms of where the network is at, but then how do you customize it in terms of the relevance that it can provide uh, bringing on board uh, those uh, those hosts in a very transparent way uh, and then you know keep keep the agility of it and keep the, the speed of innovation going. Right, right. So Eric, I want to come back to you and shift gears kind of back to the people. We'll leave the IoT yeah. and the machines along, uh, alone for a middle, uh, <laughs> minute, but I'm curious about what is beat the boss? I mean, I, I go to your LinkedIn profile and it's just filled with congratulatory uh, statements, but everyone's talking about beating the boss. You know, it's, it's a really 
you know, kind of interesting and different way to, to motivate people to build this new skill set in terms of getting software certifications uh, mm -hmm. within the Cisco world. And I just thought it was really cute the way that you uh, clearly got people motivated because there's posts all over the place and they've all got their, their nice big badge of their certification. But you know, at, at a higher level, it is a different motivation to be a developer versus an engineer mm -hmm. and a technician, and it's a you know kind of a different point of view. And I just wonder if you could share you know some of the ways that you're you're kind of encouraging you know kind of this transformation within your own workforce as well as the partners, et cetera, and really adopting kind of almost a software first and this program kind of point of view versus you know I'm just wiring stuff up. Apparently, a lot of people like to beat me. So I mean, that's, uh, that in and of itself was uh, was a uh, was a great success. But you know, it, it, if we think if we take a step back, you know, what is Cisco about as an organization? Uh, I mean, obviously, if you look back to the very early days of of our vision, right, it was it was to change the way the world you know worked, played, lived, and learned. And if you think about, and you hit on this when we were in your discussion with Co with uh, with Kuhn in the early days of COVID we really saw that play out as so much shifted from you know, in-person type of interactions to virtual interactions. And the network that, uh, that our, our customers, our partners, our employees built over the course of the last several, or, or last three decades, really helped the world continue to, um, to, to do business, for students to continue to go to, uh, to school, or you know, clinicians to connect with patients. If I think about that mission, to me, programmability is just the next iteration of that mission. Continuing to enable the world to communicate, continuing to enable customers, employees, uh, partners uh, to essentially leverage the network for more than just connectivity now, to leverage it for critical insight. Again, if we look at some of the, uh, some of the, the use cases that we're seeing for social distancing and contact tracing, the network has a really important place to play there because we can pull insight from it. But it isn't necessarily an out of the box type of integration. So I look at programmability and, and what we're doing with, with DevNet to give relevance to the network for those types of really critical conversations that every organization is having right now. It's a way to extrapolate. It's a way to pull critical data so that I can make a decision. And I, if that decision is automated, or if that decision requires some type of a manual intervention. Regardless, we're still about connecting. And in this case, we're connecting insight with the people who need it most. Right. The DevNet challenge we ran is really in respect for how critical this new skill set's going to be. It's not enough, like I said, just to connect the world anymore. We need to leverage that net the network for that critical insight. And when we drove, we, we created the Beat the Boss challenge, it was really simple. Hey guys, I think this is important. And I am going to go out and I'm going to achieve this certification myself because I want to continue to be very relevant. I want to continue to be able to provide that insight for my customers and partners. So therefore I'm going for it. Anybody can get there before me. Maybe there's a little incentive tied to it. I love it. And um, the incentive, although it's funny, we interviewed a lot of, uh, a lot of our team who, uh, who achieved it. The incentive was secondary. They just wanted to have the bragging rights. Like, yeah, I beat Eric. So, right. hey, more power to Right, absolutely. No, that's, uh, it's, it, it, you know, putting your money where your mouth is, right? If it's important, then what, you know, you should do it too. And, and you know, the whole, you're not asking people to do what you wouldn't do yourself. So I think there's a lot of good le leadership, uh, leadership lessons there as well. But I want to, extend kind of the conversation on the COVID impact, right? Because I'm sure you've seen all the social media memes, mm -hmm. you know, who's driving your digital transformation, the CEO, the CMO, <laughs> or COVID, and we all know the answer to the question. But, you know, you guys have already been dealing with kind of in increased complexity around enterprise infrastructure world in terms of cloud and public cloud and hybrid cloud and multi-cloud, and people are trying to move stuff all, all the way around. Now suddenly had this COVID moment, right, in, in March, which is really a light switch moment. People didn't have time to plan or prepare for suddenly everybody working from home and it's not only you, but your spouse and your kids and everybody else. So, I, and, but now we're six months plus into this thing. And I, I would just love to get your perspective, uh, you know, and kind of the change from, oh my goodness, we have to react to the light switch moment. What do we do to make sure people can, can get, get what they need when they need it from where they are. Uh, but, but then really moving from, this is a, an emergency situation, a stopgap situation to, hmm, 
This is going to extend for some period of time, and even when it's the acute crisis is over, you know, this is going to drive a, a, a real change in the way that people communicate, in the way that people, where they sit and do their jobs, and, and kind of how customers are responding accordingly as the, you know, kind of the narrative has changed from an emergency stopgap to this is the new normal that we really need to, uh, to plan for. So uh, I, think, I think you said it very well. I think anything that could be digitized, any, any interaction that could be driven virtually was. And what's interesting is we, as you said, we went from that light switch moment where, and I, and I believe the stat is this, and I'll probably get the number wrong, but like in the United States here, at the, begin, at the end of February, about 2% of the knowledge worker population was virtual, you know, working from home or in a, in a remote work environment. And over the course of about 11 days, that number went from 2% to 70%. Wow. And interestingly, that it worked. You know, there was a lot of hiccups along the way, and there was a lot of organizations making really quick decisions on how do I enable VPN scale at mass? How do I, you know, leverage, uh, you know, things like WebEx for virtual meetings and virtual connectivity uh, much faster? Now that, as you said, that we've kind of gotten out of the fog of, uh, of, of war or fog, fog of battle, Organizations are looking at what they accomplished, and it was nothing short of Herculean. And looking at this now from a transition to, oh my gosh, we need to change, to we have an opportunity to change. And we're look, we see a lot of organizations, specifically around uh, financial services, healthcare, uh, the, uh, the K through 20 uh, educational environment, all looking at how can they do more virtually for a couple of reasons. Obviously, there is a significant safety factor. And again, we're still in the, we're still in the, uh, the height of this pandemic. They want to make sure their employees, their customers, students, patients remain safe. But second, um, we've found in, in discussions with a lot of senior IT executives at our customers that people are happier working from home. People are more productive working from home. And that, again, the network that's been built over the course of the last few decades has been resilient enough to allow that to happen. And then third, there is a potential cost savings here. Outside of people, the next most expensive resource that organizations are paying for is real estate. If they can shrink that real estate footprint while providing a better user experience at the locations that they're maintaining, again, leveraging things like location services, leveraging things like uh, unified collaboration that's very personalized to the end user's experience, they're going to do that. And again, they're going to save money. They're going to have happier employees. And ultimately, they're going to make their, uh, their employees and their customers a lot safer. So we see, we believe that there is, in some parts of the economy, a shift that is going to be more permanent. And some estimates put it as high as 15% of the current workforce is going to stay in a, in a virtual or a semi-virtual working environment for the foreseeable future. Interesting, and I, and I and I would say I'd say fifteen percent is low, especially if you if you mm -hmm. qualify it with you know part time, right? I, I, there was a yeah. great uh, interview we were doing, and and it, you know talking about working from home. You used to work from home as the exception, right? Because the cable person was coming, or you get a, a new washing machine or something. Where now that's probably get you know in many cases will shift to the other, where I'm generally going to work from home unless you know somebody's in town or having an important meeting or there's some special collaboration. Uh, that drives me to be in. But, you know, I want to go back to you, Kuhn, and, and really double down on, you know, I think most people spent too much time focusing, especially we'll just say within the virtual event space where we play on the things you can't do uh, virtually. We can't meet in the hall. We can't grab a, a quick coffee and a drink. Instead of focusing mm -hmm. on the positive things, like we're accomplishing right here. You're in Belgium, right? Eric is in Ohio. Right. We're in California. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, we didn't take three days to, to travel and, and check into a hotel and, and all that stuff to get together uh, for this period of time. So there's a lot of stuff that digital enables. And, and I think you know, people need to focus more on that versus continuing to focus on the two or three things that, that it doesn't replace. And it doesn't replace those. So let's just get that off the table yeah. and move on with our lives because those aren't coming back for any time soon. No, totally. I think it's the balance of those things. It's guarding the, the fact that you're not necessarily working for home. I think the trick there is you could be sleeping at the office, but I think the positives are way, way more outspoken. Um, I, you know, I look at myself, I got 
much more exercise time in these last couple of months than I usually do because you don't travel, you don't have the jet lag and the connection. And then you talked about those face-to-face moments. I think a lot of people are in a way um, wanting to go back to the office part-time as, as Eric also explained, but a lot of it you can do uh, virtually. We, we have virtual coffees with the team or you know, even here in Belgium, our, our local general manager has a, a virtual aperitif every Friday. I obviously skipped the one this week, but uh, you know, there's there's ways to be very creative with the technology and the quality of the technology that the network enables, um, you know, to to get the best of both worlds. Right. So I just we're going to wrap the segment. I want to give you guys both the last word. You've both been at Cisco for a while, and you know, Susie Wee and the team on on DevNet ha has really grown this thing. I think we were there at the very beginning, a couple, four, five, six years ago. I can't keep track of time anymore. But you know, it's really, really grown, and you know, the timing is terrific to get into this more software-defined world, which is where we are. I wonder if you could just, you know, kind of share a couple thoughts, as, you know, with a little bit of perspective, and you know, what you're excited about today, and kind of what you see coming down the road since you guys have been there for a while. You've been in this space. Uh, let's start with you, Kuhn. I think the, the possibility it creates, I think really programmability software defined is really about the art of the possible. It's what you can dream up and then go code. Um, uh, Eric talked about the relevance of it and how it you know, maximizes that relevance on a customer basis. Um, you know, and then it is the evolution of, of the teams in terms of the creativity that they can bring to it. Uh, we're seeing really people dive into that and customers um, co-creating with us and I think that's uh, where we're going in terms of like the evolution of the value proposition there in terms of what technology can provide, but also how it impacts people as we discussed and, and redefines process. I love that, the art of the possible, which is a lot harder to execute in, uh, in hardware than it is in software. It certainly takes a lot longer. Very Eric, much so. I'd love to get your, uh, your thoughts. Absolutely, so I started my career at Cisco uh, turning, uh, putting IP phones onto the network. And back then, you know, it was, you know, 2001, 2002, when uh, the idea of putting telephones onto the network was such a, um, just such an objectionable idea. And so many purists were telling us all the reasons it wouldn't work. Now, if we go forward again, 19 years, the idea of not having them plugging into the network is a ridiculous idea. So we have a, we're looking at an inflection point in this industry, and it's really, it's not about programming, it's not necessarily about programming, it's about doing it smarter. It's about being more efficient. It's about driving automation. But again, it, it's, it's about unlocking the value of what the network is. We've moved so far past what, you know, just connectivity. The network touches everything. And as more workload moves to the cloud, as more workload moves to things like containers, um, the network is the really the only common element that ties all of these things together. The network needs to take its rightful place uh, in the in the IT lexicon as being that critical or, or that pr critical insight provider um, for for how users are interacting with the network, how users are interacting with applications, how applications are interacting with one another. Programmability is a way to do that more efficiently, uh, with greater a gr greater degree of certainty, with much greater relevance into the overall delivery of IT services and digitization. So to me. I think we're going to look back 20 years from now, or probably even 10, and say, man, we used to configure things manually. Well, what was that like? Right. I, I, think, I think really this is, this is the future, and I think we want to be aligned with where we're going versus where we've been. Right. Well, Kuhn, Eric, thank you for, for sharing your perspective. You know, it's, it's really nice to have you know, some historical reference. Uh, and it's also mm -hmm. nice to be living in a new age where you can, you can you know, stay at the same company and, and still refresh you know, new challenges, new opportunities and grow this thing. Because as you said, I remember those IP, first IP phone days and I thought, well, Ma Bell must be happy because the old uh, Mother's Day problem is finally solved when we don't have to have a dedicated connection between every mother and every child. Uh, in the middle of May, so good news. So thank you very much for sharing your, uh, your insights and really, uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, he's Kuhn, he was Eric, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE for continuing coverage of Cisco DevNet Connect. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.